Hello, this is Pastor Gavin Whitcomb from Warriors Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. You ready to dig into the Word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask you to bless now as we study your Word. May you open our eyes and our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're uh, talking about biblical relationships today. You know, uh, as I record this, Valentine's Day is next week, and it's hard to find a more biblical subject than the idea of love. And uh, so we're going to look at some biblical rela- uh, biblical principles that help to uh, build good relationships. And this would apply especially to marriage, but to other relationships as well. Life is built on relationships with other people. Unless you're a hermit and you live out in the wilderness all by yourself, uh, there are other people involved. And, and so if these principles are taken and consistently applied by everybody involved, then they're going to work. So um, Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, uh, Jesus was asked a question. When the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, you know, putting him to the test and probably trying to trip him up in his words or get him to say something wrong, uh, tempting him, um, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? You know, what's the biggest commandment, the most important commandment? Now, you know, that is a great commandment question. That is a good question. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So, no, what Jesus was saying is that, you know, to, to love the Lord your God with all your being, you know, all your heart, and all your soul, and some other passages, he says, and all your strength. In other words, that that speaks of serving God and and, uh, doing the things that God wants us to do and and serving in the Lord's work with all your strength and uh, with all your mind. Now, what does it mean to love God? Do you love God? Well, uh, loving God means that we highly esteem and we honor him. And we, we acknowledge him in all our ways, and we because we think highly of him and love him, we, we want to keep his commandments. I, I know I just used the word love in the definition, but you, you hold God in high esteem, and you honor him, and you, you want him involved in your life, and you want, your, you want to think about him, and uh, you obey his commandments. That's the proof that we love the Lord. Do you love God? That's the greatest commandment. And then he said, uh, and the second greatest commandment is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, what what I've just read to you is nothing new. You know, if if you've been a Christian or you have any knowledge about God's word, we know that elsewhere the Apostle Paul said that the entire moral law of God can be summarized in those two commandments. Love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. But the question is, is that the way we live? Are we practicing? Yeah, they're easy to understand, but, and we know them, but are we living them and are we doing them? That's the important thing. And hopefully the case is yes. And if we recognize we're failing, we should be quick to repent and to uh, make it right and get back up on the right path. So what is, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, love is doing what's best for others without the motive of personal gain. And a lot of people, they have this idea that love is a feeling. Well, you know, there are feelings with love, and but feelings can come and go. The biblical love that God is talking about that he requires us to, to have for our neighbor as ourself, that kind of uh, biblical love is more of an attitude or way of thinking that's accompanied by actions. So it's a way of thinking that says, I want what's best for others. And you know, um, hatred is the opposite of love, but you know, there's another sense in which selfishness 
is the opposite of love. You know, selfishness is I want what I want and I don't care about anyone else. Well, love is the opposite. Love is, hey, I care about other people too. Yes, I care about myself and my own well-being, but I care about you too. And I want what's best for you. So I'm going to treat you right in, a, in, in accordance with God's word and his principles and his commandments. That's biblical love. And that's a choice. Why can God command it? Well, because we can choose to love others. We can choose to view others and treat them in that way. So um, now when it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, Jesus said, you know, we, when we deal with other people, we should think, you know, as you would that men should do unto you, you know, do, do to them, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, a guiding principle to help you love is, would I want somebody to do this to me? Would I want someone to say this to me? Would I want someone else to treat me like this? And, and so that's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, if the whole world would consistently live by that principle, wouldn't the world be a much better place? And of course the answer is yes. Well, we can have that better place in our own lives, in our, in our own homes. So um, when it comes to your neighbor, Jesus was asked, who is your neighbor? And in the parable of the Good Samaritan, everyone is our neighbor. But who's our nearest neighbor? That would be our spouse or our family members. They're our neighbors. They're our nearest neighbor, right? That They're included in love your neighbor as yourself. And so our greatest effort to love should be expended on our family and our nearest uh, neighbors. And, and so if, uh, if we fail to love them the way that we should, um, we, we should feel grieved and that should cause us to seek the Lord to to help us better relate to them. Now, so so consistently applying God's principles to our marriage or other relationships, it'll um, <clears throat> it'll lead to peace and harmony. Now, I'm talking about consistently applying God's principles. I mean, we can't say things aren't going too well. So, okay, today I'm gonna really try to practice and apply God's principles and then then oh things didn't get better so the next day you quit that's the, the consistent application is what we're after here so if if you're not married don't zone out on me please because these principles yes they apply to marriage but they apply to other areas as well and and if you're not married you might have ch uh, uh, children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or you know, maybe you're widowed or whatever. You might have other younger people in your family who might have trouble in their relationships, and you, you can help them and encourage them by uh, teaching these principles to them and encouraging them to follow them. Okay, now, the first principle uh, would be Christ-centeredness. What I mean is we, you and I who are saved, we should live a Christ-centered life. In other words... Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Lord means master. Okay, so he is our king. He reigns and rules in our hearts. And so he, he's our boss. So we follow and do what he says. And so we live a Christ-centered life. Jesus is at the center of our life. We live our life uh, in, in such a way that we care about what he cares about and we want to do what he says and we want to honor him so christ has to be at the center of our lives for our home to really succeed and have god's blessing when jesus is the lord of our home we seek to honor and obey him and, we, and do things his way and if we fail we repent and we seek reconciliation with one another okay so first peter three fifteen says sanctify the lord god in your hearts what does it mean, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts? It means give God a special place of honor in your hearts by acknowledging him as Lord, as master. Okay, our life is not our own. When we get saved, uh, the Lord saves us and redeems us. Then our life belongs to God. It belongs to Christ. Colossians 2.6 uh, tells us this. Um, 
as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now, what does that mean, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord? So walk ye in him. Well, how did we, we receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, we received him by faith, right? So we are to walk by faith, not by sight. But we've also received Christ Jesus the Lord. Okay, so we received him not only as our Savior, but we received him as our Lord. So when we walk in him that way, Jesus is our Savior and our Lord and the Lord of our life. And he should be the Lord of our home. Do you know Psalm 101 verse 2 says this, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Well, I'm going to walk, in other words, at home where I live. I'm going to live according to God's principles and practice the faith at home as well as when I'm out with other people or when I'm at church. So no room for hypocrisy there. No room for a double life like, oh, when you're around other people, I'm a real goody two-shoes. But then when you're at home, you treat other people like dirt. And uh, no, he says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Now, I like what Joshua said in Joshua twenty four fifteen, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And he says this, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua, you know, first of all, that shows us he took the responsibility to be the spiritual leader of his family. And he said, as for me and my house, house means household, my family, we will serve the Lord. You can choose who you're going to serve. We're going to serve the Lord. And that's what we need to do as a family. Hey, uh, as for me and my house, our household, we're going to serve the Lord. Okay, so Christ-centeredness. Are you keeping Christ the center of your life? Uh, you know, Matthew 6, uh, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, Jesus said. Now, there's another portion of scripture in Matthew 19, and this is the next principle, and it's the, uh, the principle of commitment. If you want your relationships to work, there needs to be commitment. Now, what's commitment? Well, that's the idea, okay, I'm committed to you. And so no matter what happens, we might have good times, we might have bad times, we might have difficulties, challenges in our relationship that we face, but I'm here, I'm always going to be here, faithful and forever. You can count on me. And if problems arise, we're going to work it out. And through it all, we are going to stay together. Uh, that's commitment. Now, in Matthew 19, they asked Jesus a question. It came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, the word put away, that phrase means to divorce. And the question was, is it okay to divorce? That wasn't the, the entire question. Is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any or for every cause, for any reason? Why did he ask that? Well, there was a, there was a debate. There were two famous rabbis. One of the rabbis was Hillel. I think I'm pronouncing his word correctly, his name. And Hillel taught that it's lawful for a man to, device, or to, to divorce his wife for any cause, any reason. Just make sure you take care of the paperwork and write or bill divorcement. Okay? That's what Hillel taught. But uh, Shimei, and I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly too, hopefully, oh well, he taught that divorce and remarriage is only permissible in cases of divorce. 
If you have a spouse that cheats on you, is unfaithful, you can divorce and then you can marry another. So, so they're asking Jesus, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Is uh, Hillel correct, basically? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So how many genders did God create? Two, right? Male and female. And um, so rather than Jesus going right to the idea of is it okay to divorce for any reason, he focuses first on the purpose of marriage. And so God made them at the beginning male and female, and he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. Cleave means cling to. And they twain shall be one flesh. Okay, so the two become one. Wherefore they are no more twain, meaning two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus said, hey, because God said when you get married, you're one flesh and God put you together. It's not something that man should separate. So then they ask, well, then why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? That's in Deuteronomy 24. Jesus said, well, Moses allowed this because of the hardness of your hearts. He allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So in other words, uh, that, that wasn't God's plan from the beginning. But in the law of Moses, God made an accommodation to man's weakness, but it, it wasn't his plan. Uh, it was because of the hardness of their hearts, Moses allowed it. So it's going to happen anyway. So God gave some regulations to impede it. Uh, and, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife... Except it be for fornication, and mar shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now, Jesus' point was this. Yeah, you might go through the paperwork and say, okay, it's an official divorce, so now I'm not married to that person anymore, so I can go and remarry. But Jesus said, when you do that, you're, you're breaking the spirit of the commandment, thou shalt commit adultery. So in that sense, you're committing adultery. This idea of, oh, I'm married to someone else, I see someone I like better, so I'm going to divorce this person and marry someone else, that, that's, that's adultery. But Jesus did say there's an exception to this. He said, except it be for fornication. Okay, if your spouse commits adultery against you, there's biblical grounds for divorce. So, Unless your spouse is cheating on you uh, or they abandon you and desert you, uh, there's no biblical grounds for divorce. So, in other words, get the idea of divorce out of your mind. God says we should have an attitude of commitment. So, no matter what problems in, uh, arise, and shame on you if you are a discontented, dissatisfied spouse and you're threatening your spouse to divorce them without biblical grounds, shame on you. And I ask you to just accept that reproof. It's wrong. That's the totally wrong attitude. How are you going to have successful relationships with that attitude? That, that's a hindrance. So God would have us um, navigate our troubles through, uh, through the idea of, hey, I'm, whatever it is, we're committed so divorce is not an option. Unbiblical divorce is not an option. We're going to work through our problems. Okay, now, so we have Christ-centeredness and commitment. Now, the next key to successful relationships and marriage and other relationships is clemency. Now, I chose the word clemency because it starts with a C. Uh, I, I couldn't resist. But clemency is you, you have a merciful attitude that is willing to forgive. Okay, forgiveness. You know, people are fallen, imperfect creatures. I am a fallen, imperfect creature. Am I perfect? No, I make no claim to be perfect. I make no claim to be sinless. I do make this claim, and it's true for my heart, that I'm sincere, but sometimes I fail.
and and people are that way we all have faults we all have failures we all have shortcomings and sometimes we may let other people down i'm sure sometimes i let people down i mean i am i have my flaws i'm human and and so are you so god teaches us to extend mercy and grace and forgiveness towards those who trespass against us and this is nothing new but sometimes we need to be reminded of this and so um what what did jesus he said forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you remember in the lord's prayer forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us right forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors are you a forgiving person if not if you are not a forgiving person who who let me ask you this who do you think you are <laughs> i mean you never sin what you never fail you never do anything that that is not right towards others you're never in need of forgiveness so how can you withhold that forgiveness from others so what is forgiveness well forgiveness is releasing others from the debt that we feel they owe us because of their harmful actions towards us it means granting them a pardon and so far as is reasonable and possible not not holding their offense against them and our forgiveness of others should be patterned after God's forgiveness of our sins. You know, let me read to you Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. He says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, in other words, as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, put on bowels of mercies, okay, a heart of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as christ forgave you so also do ye and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness and uh so uh, clemency or forgiveness that's a key component of any successful relationship and uh, marriage or, you know, uh, children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, co-workers, fellow church members. Now, the, the next um, principle is the principle of kindness. Now, we know from God's word we're, we're to be kind one to another, right? And uh, ki what is kindness? Well, it's doing good to others. That's basically the meaning of kindness. So, when we think of kindness, we think of doing good things. But, you know, kindness also extends to our speech. In other words, it ought to. In uh, Proverbs 31, verse 26, he describes the virtuous woman. And he says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Inner tongue is the law of kindness. In other words, what she says is governed by kindness. And that's a good thing for a virtuous woman, but it's also good for a virtuous, wise, and godly man as well. So a good question to ask ourselves before we say something. Is it true? Is it kind? And uh, is it necessary? And would it be better if I didn't say this? So... Um, inner tongue is a law of kindness and and so we should be kind in our words and uh in our actions certainly be kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you that's ephesians 4 32 but then into chapter 5 it says be therefore followers of god as dear children followers meaning it's the greek word mimikai mimic god Mimic and imitate God, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Okay, so, um, now, uh, it's, it's also important to, to be kind in our thoughts. Do you ever think about this? See, if we're kind, 
It's possible to think unkind things about people or think in an unkind way. So if we're thinking about our spouse or our other family members or church members or coworkers, if we're thinking about them in an unkind way, that's what leads to unkind words and unkind thoughts. Okay, so that's the real key. Think kind thoughts about other people. Now, there's um, another principle, the fifth and final principle, and that is the principle of self control. What's self-control? Well, just what it says, control yourself, right? And, and God's word teaches us that we should have self-control. In fact, self-control is a part of the, it's a fruit of the spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, the Bible explains the fruit of the spirit. And it says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. What is temperance? Well, temperance is self-control. Okay, so self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it's not only a fruit of the Spirit, but it's a sign of emotional maturity as well. How do little babies and uh, little toddlers and little kids sometimes act? Well, they don't control themselves, do they? So they have to learn self-control. That's one of the things that you and I as parents and grandparents, we try to teach our kids and grandkids, right? Self-control. Now, um, unrighteous anger can be very harmful and destructive to relationships. And so Proverbs 16.32 says this, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. What a great verse. So we should, to, to rule our spirit means to control our spirit, control our attitude, control our temper. He says, if you're slow to anger, you're better than the mighty. That's better than somebody that conquers, leads military forces and conquers a city. One of my uh, teachers in, in Bible college used to say that self-conquest is the greatest conquest. To conquer yourself and to have self-control, that's the greatest conquest. That's, that's what this verse really is teaching. Be slow to anger and rule your spirit. If you don't have self-control, then it's going to cause problems in your relationship. If you don't control your temper, uh, an angry man stirs up strife. You're going to stir up strife if you don't control your temper and you you spray other people with anger and temper tantrums. But also an out-of-control tongue can do the same. We need to control our temper and our tongue. Proverbs 21.23 says, Whoso keepeth, to keep means to guard, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from trouble. You want to keep yourself out of trouble? One way to do that is guard or keep your tongue. So self-control, control control your temper. God says we are to control our tongue and uh, what we say. And, uh, you know, we need to ask the Lord to help us. In, In Proverbs 12, 18, it says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. In other words, there's some people that the way they talk, the the way they speak, it's like a sword that pierces and hurts other people. Uh, And and so we can destroy other people, destroy our relationships, if we use our tongue like a sword to hurt people and to injure people. He says, there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Okay, so if you're wise, you're not going to be going around stabbing people and hurting people by saying mean, nasty, unkind things. You're going to use your tongue to impart health and well-being and a blessing to others. You know, the psalmist, he said, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. He was saying, Lord, I'm acknowledging I need you to help guard my mouth 
and help guard the door of my lips because I do not want to say things that are bad or hurtful and destructive to others. You know, walking in the Spirit gives us power over the, and, and victory over the flesh. In Galatians 5, it says, if you walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And what we need to do when we're tempted to say things that are not good or tempted to react in the wrong way, say, Lord, please give me your wisdom and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, please take control of me. I don't want to react in the wrong way. I want you to fill me and guide me and, and help me to respond the right way. Walk in the Spirit, you won't act that way. You won't lack self-control. You'll be kind. You'll be forgiving. You'll um, uh, express a, an attitude of commitment, and you'll be Christ-centered. James. So this, not, a lot of these things are not new, but uh, James says this, Be ye doers of the word, James one twenty two. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. We can do this. Now go do it. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may uh, he lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace and self-control. May the fruit of the Spirit be abundantly uh, manifested in your life and in mine. God bless you.